Welcome to the Enneagram 2.0 podcast. I am Beatrice Chestnut. And I'm Uranio Pais. Today, we're talking about the passions and the virtues associated with the Enneagram system and how to use them for self-development, basically how to move from being consumed by the passion to embodying the higher virtue. Uranio, can you help us understand what the passions are? Define, define the passions and, and for us uh, to start off with. Okay, so I think that you and I, B, agree that the passion is one of the key components of our psyche, and more specifically, the lower side of ourselves, which we call personality. The passion is uh, central to what Gurdjieff called the lower emotional center, meaning it's the basic emotional tone, heart state, and also the basic emotion itself that each of us carry along with us uh, everywhere we go. And it's almost ever present. The passion here means that uh, we are controlled by it. It doesn't, it, it, we don't control it. It controls us. And this is why we call it a passion. And although we have traits of all nine emotions, that happens only with one of them. And this is why we call that our passion. And this is why you and me believe that we need to concentrate a lot on our own type uh, instead of looking at uh, two or three different points of the Enneagram to define who we are. Yes, it's the passion can be difficult to understand um, already in what you're saying in your in your definition. You mentioned that this is an emotion. Well, it's interesting because I think when I think of an emotion, I think of fear or sadness or anger, uh, disappointment. Uh, but these are, you know, pride and uh, anger and fear, of course, but gluttony and lust and sloth or laziness. So they're a little bit more complicated, I think, than what we think of as average everyday emotions. Now, I think it's really important to realize that when we're talking about the passion, you know, it can sound like something good, right? Like I feel strongly about something. Uh, but the passion in, in, in our Enneagram type that drives us as a central motivating factor that is often really unconscious it's almost more like the meaning of passion in the phrase crime of passion. It's like you're overcome by something. Uh, it's compulsive. Uh, and again, often you don't realize that you are being driven by this very compulsive emotion. Yes. This way, be uh, I, I like to see it as a straight jacket that we all have, you know? And also passion, the passion of our type is a very key source of suffering. In the beginning, we don't know how much we suffer because of it. And it takes self-observation first and then emotional work on the passion to be able to see how much we suffer because of it. And this is why I also like to associate the term passion here on the Enneagram with passion as in passion of Christ. You know, the, the suffering of Christ within all his process uh, towards the end of his life. And the, the original root meaning of the word passion is to suffer. And I think there have been people lately who have, who have you know, quite correctly noted that this element of the Enneagram system can be a little bit complicated to understand. Uh, it, it harkens back to some old language uh, from where the Enneagram came from in the first place, old spiritual teachings. Uh, for instance, the passions of the Enneagram types are the seven deadly sins of the Christian tradition, plus fear and deceit. Uh, but I think that that only, for me, deepens the importance of understanding what the passion is and what the nine passions are for each of the Enneagram types. Because like you're saying, it is a central source of our suffering. And although I think sometimes the people can say, well, the Enneagram seems a bit negative or it's making me feel like there's something wrong with me. Um, of course, I can understand how people have those responses. But I think what's really important when we work with the Enneagram and not say a different kind of system that doesn't get as deep to the root of who we are as the Enneagram does, 
I think part of what the Enneagram helps us do is recognize that at the core of our, us, when we are identified with a personality, which is not all of who we are, we do suffer because of that. That And the passion is in some ways the, the root cause of our underlying suffering. It's compulsive. It's something we, be, we, we get overcome by, as in getting overcome by a strong emotion that's triggered from something on the outside, but that we are passive in the face of it, that we suffer because, and to the extent that we are not in touch with, we are not consciously aware of exactly what this passion feels like, looks like, and ends up uh, looking like, especially on the outside when it drives our behavior. Yeah, great. And while you were speaking, B, I was remembering something that is said in Buddhism. Um, in Buddhism, they say that the source of all suffering is desire, right? And um, passion in here has to do with a heart's desire. It's like our heart compulsively wants something and believes that unless we get that, we will not be happy. But uh, even when we have it, we are not happy. And that is a compulsion and that's a trap. So the idea also so that we can start understanding what the virtues are is, uh, and the virtues are the opposite of the passion here is that we understand that while we are moved by desire and an uncontrollable desire, we are not there yet. We are being held hostages of this mechanism called a personality. Now, the virtue, instead of a desire, it points out to a higher need that we actually have from the perspective of our soul and not from the perspective of this uh, lower heart that we are talking about. Do you agree with this, B? What is your take? Yes, it's a little bit like getting more and more conscious of what drives the lower heart when we're in personality. And when we're seized by the passion, when it kind of takes us over, we are not ourselves. And one of the things we do when we work with the Enneagram to become more aware of our ego patterns is we're in, in essence studying the way we aren't being who we are. We're being who our personality is. And to the extent that we can become more aware of the passion that drives the personality and take, kind of takes us over uh, and, and, and makes it so we're not consciously in charge of directing our own lives, uh, we can leave room for working toward its opposite which is the higher virtue. So almost going from the lower heart mm -hmm. to a higher state of consciousness or a higher state of the heart. And this is also something that the Enneagram explains brilliantly, um, that we all have higher level uh, centers of intelligence, not only the basic centers of intelligence that sometimes are explained also in other models. So rising above your passion also means being able to have access to higher uh, centers of intelligence that become operative only for people who get to a special place, a special state of being. But I would like to come back to something, B, because um, I think that people sometimes believe wrongly that uh, the passion of type is necessarily a, a seeable behavior that the person has. And that's not true. Uh, actually, it's better to, to understand the passion as a state of the heart. And that means that the heart is, in normal conditions, is uh, in one specific state according to what the passion of your type is. Like... For me, as a five, because the passion of my type is what we call avarice, uh, my heart shuts down. So the disconnection that happens normally for me as a five starts in that disconnection happening in my heart. So avarice is a state of the heart disconnecting or being disconnected. Um, and all the behavioral traits come uh, later as, as a consequence. 
And maybe sometimes I'm even talking to people or, you know, being there in the world, but my heart is not completely open. Um, so you won't see the behavior of Everest, but the state of the heart is like that. Well, I think you will see behavior as a result of the state of the heart, right? So these passions, these, these emotional states do have indirect and direct manifestations in behavior, right? So if I'm in pride, I may say things, I may act in a certain way, that's being driven by pride, often in a way that I don't see. So although exactly like you're saying, the passion isn't necessarily something that's always observable in behavior, uh, oftentimes when we're really in that in the grip of the passion, uh, we are acting it out in ways we don't see, and that can result in certain behavior patterns. Do you agree? Yeah, exactly. I agree, exactly. Only that because it's almost ever present, it happens also, at least to me, when I'm alone. You know, I can be alone and not be seen or not be doing anything and still my heart being a little shut down, you know. So, uh, so one thing to understand is the passion is active uh, while you are not having a, a spiritual experience of true expansion um, and not having an amazing different state of being with you right now so it's almost always there it's that we are we haven't been trained to look correctly right we need to remember that our passion is ever present it's with us all the time it's it's probably almost always active unless you're making a big effort to be present and conscious and so one of the first things you, to, to start doing after you hear this podcast is to start looking at what you're doing, how you're feeling, what's going on inside. And I have to tell you, I actually notice my passion more when I'm by myself than I'm when I'm with other people. Maybe it's being a two and when I'm with other people, my attention is more on them than it is on my internal process. But when I've really started to see how it's there all the time is when I'm sort of walking along and the things that I think to myself or the fantasies I have or the imagination, uh, the, the sort of episode that shows up in my imagination, oftentimes that's where I see my pride showing up. Right, right, right. And, you know, B, I, I don't know what you think, but I have a, a, a positive belief that right now, people who are listening to us, they, they really want to speak more bluntly about things and they want to hear the truth uh, without much disguise and people are, don't want more of the same. So I don't really think we need to hide uh, the, the fact that the passion is bad or try to, to make it look better. Or, uh, or just say that uh, there are good things and bad things about it. I think we need to name that the passion is a problem, is an obstacle, and that our journey with the Enneagram is here to help us move beyond it or rise above it. I do understand that people are sensitive to getting the message when they learn about the Enneagram that there's something wrong with them or there's something negative about who they are. Uh, and so I, I do want to speak to that. And, and I think it makes sense that people are sensitive to that, right? I think most of us are way too self-critical and that's part of our problem. And that's usually, importantly, the personality, not who you are. When you're self-critical, when you feel bad about yourself, when you interpret what you hear as being a judgment on who you are, I think it's understandable. Uh, but we want to be really, really clear here. The passion is not a good thing. Um, but that it doesn't mean that you're not essentially good. On the contrary, uh, what's not good is when we are so identified with our ego and the ego wants to keep itself alive, wants to stay in charge, but the ego actually blocks you from being all of who you can be. So what we're talking about here is not a good thing, but it doesn't mean that you're not good uh, and it doesn't mean that we're judging. It means that we're naming in a very honest way 
the activity of the ego that we need to be very clear about naming so that we can observe it and eventually reduce it and express more of all the goodness that's inside of us because we're not blocking ourselves through these unconscious habits associated with the lower self or the ego or the personality, which is kind of a mask. It, it, it masks the persona is something that hides our goodness uh, because it's just oriented to survival. Yes, B, yes. And uh, I think we also need to make clear that um, the state of relaxing down the passion and uh, experiencing the virtue is achievable. It's not a theory, it's not an abstraction, it is achievable. And we see it all the time with so many people, so many students that we have. Um, and so it's not something just out of our imagination or a theory. Uh, whenever we do deeper uh, inner work using the Enneagram, the Enneagram becomes this wonderful shortcut to be able to transform the passion and convert it into the virtue. And it's important maybe to understand that the passion is operating on the lower heart, like this heart is on the left-hand side inside our chest, while the virtue is connected through what we call the spiritual heart, which is another structure that can be studied, explained. It's not for us to talk about it here, but it's a big shift. You're, you're not in touch with as much pain when you are in touch with your virtue. You are reconnecting more fully with your soul and with so much potential coming from the universal heart. So the message of the Enneagram is this. It's like the Enneagram exists because of this kind of work. And when it gets reduced to a typology that explains nine personality types only, then we lose its main meaning. Yes, and in, some authors and uh, th talk about how being in personality is really... Well, it's a degradation of consciousness. All the spiritual uh, traditions teach us there's a kind of fall. Before we come into a human life, we are connected with the virtues. So adopting a personality as a survival strategy in life is a way of uh, losing touch with the virtue and then replacing it by the passion. Uh, and so when we do inner work or when we use the Enneagram for self-development in a deep way, which is exactly what it's designed for, it's all about becoming aware of the passion, the substitute, uh, the less deep uh, thing that we are focused on that really just drives us around in circles in our life to the extent that it takes us over and becomes compulsive so that we can bit by bit, step by step, disidentify with that passion and the personality patterns that it drives and leave more and more room for working more and more toward embodying the higher virtue. And it's to me, it's beautiful that within each Enneagram type, there is this, and, and I like the way you call it, a paradox between the passion we identify with when we're in personality that, that drives us, that fuels uh, our, our behavior much of the time, and how its exact opposite is this higher virtue. And I remember when, when, I, when I was in my early Enneagram training, it was called the vice to virtue conversion. Now, again, don't get too hung up on the word vice or the word sin. Uh, I, think, I think if we take these deeper meanings of them, it means missing the mark. It means there's, there is something wrong in that you aren't as fully conscious as you could be. You aren't embodying your higher self as much as is possible for you after you do inner work. So when we uh, can, ten, can understand and study and get more and more and more conscious of how our passion operates, we automatically start making this beautiful journey toward its opposite, which is the higher virtue. And the more we focus on that, the more we bring that into our life, the more we, uh, we move away from uh, compulsive habits and being stuck in identifying with something that isn't really who we are to moving more and more into a fuller and fuller recognition, realization 
of who we can be of our higher self. Right, right. And um, we are also not saying that we need to simply get rid of the passion. It's important first to own that the passion is there and has always been there uh, prevailing more than any other thing, perhaps. And so looking at it, observing that it is in there and understanding all the possible manifestations of it, because there are uh, multiple indirect manifestations of the passion that we don't always call uh, by the right name, by the passion's name. Um, so we need to learn how to observe it all the way. And then we need to start doing the purging process um, uh, of getting frustrated with that passion. Again, not with us, but with it. Uh, differentiating from it already, disidentifying from it. And uh, there are steps in that frustration. Uh, we teach them, but uh, we're not going to go through those steps today, maybe in, on another podcast. But the thing is, we need to, to really know that um, if we are not in touch with the passion, and if we don't work from within that passion, to feel frustrated about it, we will never disconnect fully from it. And therefore, we will miss that brilliant opportunity of experience our virtue. Yes, and this might be a good moment to talk a little bit about uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. For me, it's such a great illustration of exactly what we're talking about. Uh, when I learned the Enneagram and I learned about the passions, again, it's a little bit confusing. It does come from these uh, very old uh, traditions, which in my mind actually makes them uh, this whole the whole passion and virtue teaching even more deep and meaningful. Uh, but when I saw in Purgatory, in, in Dante's Divine Comedy, how the purging of the passion and the working toward the opposite, the higher virtue, is depicted in the action of the purgatory so clearly, it really helped me understand a lot about the meaning, the, the, the very profound meaning of exactly what we're talking about in terms of this, this growth opportunity embedded in the Enneagram from uh, going from recognizing the heart of how you stay unconscious in a way in your heart uh, to the higher heart, to something that automatically draws you upward. So I'll say a little bit about how this is shown to be true in Dante. And that is, you know, a lot of us have read the Inferno. We understand that in, in Dante's Divine Comedy, which again is 700 years old, so it has timeless uh, value for us, I think. Uh, in the Inferno, all the sins are there, all the Enneagram passions are in there. And it basically is about how when we're totally identified with our passion, uh, which are these uh, seven deadly sins plus fear and deceit, uh, we, in, in essence, we're stuck in something that's unpleasant, uh, that doesn't really do anything good for us forever. We're kind of going around and around in circles. So it's really interesting that in Dante's Hell, the punishment is the sin itself. It is the passion. It is being stuck in our automatic patterns. We just do it forever, which is a little bit like our lives before we, we discover something like the Enneagram and work on becoming more conscious of what keeps us stuck. But then in the purgatory, it's a mountain and there are terraces. And on each terrace, a different passion is purged or worked off or worked out of. We, they do things together in groups to release the passion, to purge it, to get rid of it. And they also work toward the exact opposite, the higher virtue. So for instance, the first terrace of, of purgatory, and again, it's a mountain. So you are going up the more work you do. Uh, and the first terrace is humility. And on the terrace of humility, the souls there purge the passion of pride. Now, everybody has to purge pride, interestingly. Everybody purges all the passions, but uh, depending on what your main issue was in life, you will have to spend more time on that terrace 
than all the other terraces. So it, in a way, it mirrors exactly what we teach with the Enneagram is there are these nine passions. We may participate a little bit in, in more than one, but there's really only one that we really need to work on in a, in a very important, deep way, uh, because it's our main problem in, in essence. And so he talks about how, for instance, some one person would have to spend 50 years on the terrace of humility, but maybe only a couple years on all the other terraces. And that person might have been a two because pride is the passion of two and humility is the higher virtue. And what will happen on each terrace is they're doing something. Like on the terrace of pride, uh, all the souls there are carrying these giant stones on their back which is all about putting their noses to the ground. So they're, they're bent over walking. And as they walk, they're seeing see stories about pride on the ground that are etched into the ground. So they're learning about stories about pride. They're carrying these big stones all to, to purge this uh, habit of pride uh, and as a way of releasing it so that they can be more in a state of humility. And then on the next terrace, it's about envy. And the so if you spend a lot of time on the terrace of envy, you might be a four. And there's ways of purging the passion of envy. And on, the, on that terrace, the souls have their eyes, their eyelids stitched shut with iron wire so that they can't look at other people and compare themselves. They're also wearing very plain clothing. They're wearing sacks. Uh, and the fours listening can know how painful that might be. So they're purging the passion of envy, and they're going toward, in Dante's scheme, generosity. Uh, in, the, in the Enneagram, it would be equanimity. So they're rising above and in, in, in going, putting their heart in this higher state that opposes envy. And in this way, uh, Dante, in a beautiful way, really kind of highlights what we need to do when we are really moving away from, through being more conscious, through doing things that oppose it, uh, the passion that, that grips us most of the time. Brilliant. The virtue is always the very opposite of the passion. It's um, almost the flip side of the coin. Um, when we fall down, um, which happens archetypally for all of us as it, as it should, we, we um, build uh, ego in a way that we end up being in the very opposite of what our soul wants to express. And that means that we go to the opposite of the virtue and the passion is that opposite. Now, uh, when, when we realize that and start doing specific work, and as you said while explaining about Dante, uh, focusing a bit more on our passion or a lot more on, on our passion than on the other ones, simply because we don't have uh, all the time we need in a lifetime to do all this work, uh, then we start creating a, a good positive split in the inside. We start to open up space at the very least for the virtue. And in the inside, we start to experience a paradox. Like for you as a Chu, pride will be there, but at times you will really feel drawn to be humble and to be in humility and to be less important or uh, less relevant. Uh, and I will have Everest, but at times I will also feel something opposite to Everest, which is a lot of energy and willingness to keep connected in all possible ways to people, you know? And that is the state of the paradox in the inside. I, you know, I've been identified with that passion, but now I'm feeling something very different. And more and more, I see that I'm not that passion. And sometimes I can even feel who I, act, who I am, actually, uh, when in touch with that virtue. But I'm not yet a, capable to stay there. And I fall back down on the passion state. So I'm in between. And it's paradoxical. Uh, so uh, clearly, we are not as obvious as before, not as easy to define. 
some people be even mistake that state of paradox um, with uh, be, uh, being of another Enneagram type, as if they were changing type or if they were wrong before. But it's only that they are individuating, like Jung would say. They are growing and they are achieving higher levels of awareness within their types. And this is because we don't change type, but we change. Um, and some other time we'll talk about levels of awareness here on uh, Enneagram 2.0 podcast. Um, now, the virtue is, is, is a beautiful manifestation of who we are uh, when in touch with our souls and in touch with our spiritual heart. It's not felt as anything similar to a lower emotion as we are used to. It's it really felt as a blessed thing. And we're talking about higher level emotions here, just as we could mention gratitude, forgiveness, and other higher level emotions, and goodness itself also. But each type reconnects back first to all those that realm of higher level emotions through one specific virtue that has been lost in the end of that falling down process. And uh, th therefore, we have become more sensitive towards it. Meaning that when we go up and we are about to have higher level experiences, we will reconnect to that particular virtue first. And through it, we are going to reconnect to all nine virtues, right? But the virtue of our type is in itself the uh, absolute opposite of what the passion of our type is. And it's good then to understand the virtue as an antidote for the passion. It's the, the thing that burns the passion down. You know, and uh, it's end of career for the passion. The problem is that we can have experiences of the virtue without being able to stay in them, and then we fall back down. It takes time, discipline, and the right methods to be able to be in touch with the virtue and stay in touch with it so that we will be taming the passion more. But having a first experience of the virtue is already very meaningful. Let's do a short break. The Enneagram 2.0 podcast goes live every other Thursday on all main platforms. Stay tuned to learn more about yourself and others. B and Yiranyu offer much, much more high quality Enneagram content on www.cpenneagram.com. If you are an Enneagram enthusiast, visit the website now, www.cpenneagram.com. So the passion of type eight is lust. Lust is a passion for excess. It's a kind of making everything they do more excessive. Uh, it's a passion for excess and intensity in all stimulation. It's a drive to fill up an inner emptiness, which most of these passions are, through physical gratification of some kind or another. Uh, now, sometimes th people think about uh, this, this passionateness or this intensity as only uh, coming through sex. That's what lust is often, uh, often thought of as referring to. However, and I, I really actually appreciate the esoteric meanings behind some of the Enneagram language. Uh, and again, I think it invites us to really engage in our inner work a little bit and not get too lazy around... Uh, not doing the work of really understanding what this uh, this really important experience is. Uh, lust is a kind of passion for making everything more expanded, uh, for getting more of something. And again, usually it's it's a more intense experience. It's often physical as eights or body types. I, th I think be for all passions, it's very important we mention a few examples among many we could mention, of indirect manifestations of it so that people see how the passion is ever present. So lust for AIDS is behind uh, the reason why AIDS get close to you when talking to you or uh, have intense eye contact. It's all 
boosted by that energy of lust or excess or expanding the energy beyond the body when approaching someone in ways that are energetically felt as being threatening by the other person, by the way, or provoking people, rebelling against the rules. It's all fueled by um, lust. Um, When writing, using adverbs of intensity, capital letters, or when talking loud voices, voice, um, being direct in the communication, power disputes, and so on. So all of that is lust. So we need to name those things as lust. Now, when we go to a higher level as eights, if you are an eight and you go to a higher level and get to experience the virtue of innocence, well, that is felt uh, as the opposite of how you you feel the, the passion of lust. Innocence is responding in a fresh, brand new way uh, to each moment, to whatever is happening here and now, without judgment, memory, expectation, and without defending yourself. You're simply open to what is happening here and now. You're vulnerable to to being in the moment, and in innocence, you don't provoke, you don't react. By the way, the state of innocence is the state of non-reactivity, okay? And this is what we see all the time, Be and just by talking about this, I remember of so many eight students of ours who do beautiful work. We see all the time in eights that are in a good place, right? They are very soft. They are very... Um, uh, aware of the impact they have on other people. I think when you see an eight in innocence, you just really see their sensitivity. It's just obvious. It's it's very apparent in the things they do and just in the in their presence. Uh, and I think that's to me the essence of the high side of eight. So now let's talk about type nine. The passion here is in the old language, it's sloth. Um, sometimes we update that to say laziness. And the definition, again, I think it's good actually to engage with these definitions and work at understanding what they mean in the any in, in the meaning of the depth of the Enneagram teaching. And this laziness is a kind of psycho-spiritual laziness. Uh, most nines that you probably know in your life, if you're a nine, you're very active. You, you're busy. You do a lot. It's not that you're a lazy in the typical meaning of the word. Uh, it's a laziness with respect to being in touch with your own sense of being. It's a kind of psycho-spiritual laziness with being awake to yourself. Nines can often work so hard on behalf of other people or on behalf of the group or the family. Uh, but for themselves, it's like they lose energy. It's like they go blind to their own importance. And this is sloth. So re- rather than a reluctance to take action, this passion is more about an inattention to self and an inertia of the will when it comes to tuning in to what's going on internally at a deeper level. I love when we say that um, sloth It's not lack of action. It's all possible action, but the right one. And the right right action is the virtue, right? But uh, before we go there, um, some of the indirect manifestations of sloth are uh, being overly calm or becoming the mediator, empathetic, selfless, understanding person, which is self self-forgetting it's in itself although it may look good in the outside uh, it's not healthy from a self-development uh, perspective losing objectivity listen too much to other people's opinions before saying one's own uh, even stubbornness sinking energy down in the body it has all to do with sloth right and then when when uh, nines uh, go to the higher uh, emotional center and connect or reconnect to the virtue of right action, nines become really, really dynamic, focused in this one thing that needs to be done. 
first of all, they know what it is. And it doesn't matter at all if this will mean confronting people or not, or if people will be happy with uh, them or not. It, they just go and do it because there is full commitment of the heart to doing what's needed. And it's usually something about themselves because they've been uh, self-forgetting. But sometimes it's also something that is stuck in any given process uh, in, in a way that they become the revolutionaries around, the ones that make uh, things work again in a new way. It's like essential movement, total emotional engagement with that movement because I finally become willing to do what's needed. And I see it with my heart and I move using my heart. So right action is in the heart because it's a heart's capacity of not only seeing but committing to what needs to be done and nobody else is doing. I love seeing nines when they're in right action because it's as if they take all the energy and nines have a lot of energy but they disperse it they kind of send it out there they give it away to other people and it's almost as if when they're in right action they collect back all the energy they dispersed outside and they they bring it into themselves and and act in this very powerful way let's talk about the passion of ones which is anger now, anger uh, as an emotional passion in one occurs in its repressed form. So it's almost like the anger of ones gets channeled into trying to do the right thing, trying to make everything better, trying to improve themselves and the world. Uh, ones display hostility toward what's imperfect, uh, the imperfect way things are, and try to force things to conform to their ideal of how things should be. Uh, so the anger can not always look like what we think of as anger. It's more the anger that leaks out in one's behavior uh, through tension in the body, uh, through, uh, through tamped down forms of anger, which would be annoyance, irritation, self-righteousness. These are sometimes the ways the passion of anger shows up for ones. Uh, and of course, for all of us, it's really healthy to get in touch with the passion to make it more conscious. And when ones can do this, it's very good for them. Some other indirect manifestations can be the, the normal tension that you see, uh, uh, you know, ones holding on their bodies, like shoulders, jaws, eyelids, forehead, lips, hands or the critical or penetrating gaze. Uh, you know, actually, both the, the critic and the inner critic come from anger. They are very angry, the critic and the inner critic inside, you know, ones. And being judging, criticizing, and just being irritated or looking irritated. It's all anger. Now, when ones grow and they get to the state of serenity, which is the virtue for ones. They are absolutely the opposite, the, the perfect opposite of all that. They are extremely calm, emotionally calm, and their bodies are totally relaxed in themselves and receptive to uh, abundance of energy in what spirit traditions call the Hara point or the Dantian. Um, and uh, serenity here is not a mental attitude at all. It's, it's more like uh, uh, allowing life force to be expressed in themselves fully and um, allowing it to become a smile or a laughter or just, uh, you know, some impulse for pleasure. Um, and the person then, then is not so much self-contained as ones tend to be in personality. When in touch with serenity, ones are truly more, uh, more free to do what, what they need to do. And if they are in touch with serenity, there is a rule. Nothing that they will do will be harmful for others or for themselves. 
you know, because it's impossible that a virtue uh, is based on bad things. It, it is always based in goodness. It's, it's something about the nature of all nine virtues. So one can finally relax and just be. And it's amazing when we see students, which happens quite often uh, at retreats, uh, being like that. They are totally relaxed, inspiring, and they, they look like they become 10 years younger right away. You know, it's, it's wonderful. What about your type B, type two? Yes, twos. So um, this is a tricky one. I'll warn you ahead of time. So pride in the language of the Enneagram functions as a need, an unconscious need for self-elevation and gets expressed as a kind of false generosity in the service of seduction and self-elevation. So it's, a, it's, it's behind the need to be important to people. Pride also fuels a pattern of self-idealization, almost like seeing yourself a little bit better than you actually are, and grandiosity, uh, seeing yourself as big and important. But also, it can be followed by a reactive devaluation and deflation. So I like to point to this because sometimes twos have a hard time really fully understanding what pride is, and this is part of the trickiness of pride. So pride in an interesting way is also synonymous with a good thing, right? Like you're proud of your child or you're proud of an accomplishment. Uh, but in, we're not talking about this in a positive sense at all. Pride for twos is this kind of need to be important, the self elevation. And it's often hard to see because it can seem the same as confidence. It's basically saying you're in control of everything. You know, the sin of Satan was to say I in the face of the only one. So he tried to put himself on the same level as God. Uh, and as an angel, he, by definition, was not on the same level. Uh, and that is why he fell to a very low place. And so it's important for us to be humble. Humility is what we'll, we'll hear about in a moment is the higher virtue. Uh, and that means not needing to see yourself as more important than you are. When we assume that everyone should like us, uh, when we drive, when we have a drive to make everyone like us, when we do things for people, thinking we can meet all the needs in the world, not being aware of our own needs, these are all ways that we tend to be uh, unaware of pride and the way pride operates. Well, it makes a lot of sense. Now, what I would add is just one point. I think Jews can spot pride more easily when they look for uh, how they, they feel excessively glad when they feel useful or needed. It's not about feeling glad. It's about feeling excessively glad. It's like, I feel very happy when uh, I help someone and the person um, thanks me. So I, I hear from Chu sometimes that that makes their day or their week, you know, and uh, this is the, the issue. The, the, the word vary, the adverb of intensity here is the problem. Now, the, the virtue of humility, it's always the opposite of the passion and humility is uh, self-acceptance of our own limitations. And as human beings, we are totally limited, right? From childhood, from babyhood, we, we can't survive without our mothers. We are the only animal species that can't. So we're very limited. And um, accepting those limitations, both in the body level and in the bigger level, is humility. So, um, you know, there is this spiritual teaching from many traditions that says, you are no one, you are no one, right? So this is uh, something that can't be felt unless you are in touch with um, the, the virtue of humility. Uh, we have um, beliefs about how important we are that are not real beliefs in our individual powers, beliefs that we are making all this uh, things uh, happen, that we are running the show. Um, and in humility, we know that we are no one. And uh, so it, it's like 
I downgrade myself to a place of uh, not as much centrality for uh, things to happen. And I allow myself to feel the relief of that. And I don't need to be the most important person for in those people's lives. I don't need to be uh, there for them all the time of, of having the solution for the problems all the time. And I have my own problems and I have my own needs. And sometimes I'm simply tired. You know, simple things like this can be acknowledged and, and expressed only when we are humble. And humility is all of that for a true and much more. Yes, for me, humility is knowing exactly how important I am and not making myself more or less. As a self-preservation too, I can tend to make myself less more often. Uh, but of course, I also make myself more, in, especially in my own head. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to three. The original passion for type three is deceit or more accurately, self-deceit, where they're actually, uh, in some sense, lying to themselves about who they are because they over-identify with their persona, with their personality, and also whatever image they need to turn themselves into in the moment uh, to appear successful, to uh, get people to admire them, and to kind of to feel okay in the world, to feel worthy of love. It's like threes feel like they have to earn it by uh, identifying with what's valued and turning themselves into that. So self-deceit is a kind of shape-shifting. It's a identification of what people see as valuable or admirable, and then automatically, with no thinking involved, just automatically, it's this state of the heart of, of turning yourself in from into whatever is valued from the inside, such that you can appear like a chameleon or shape shift into different forms uh, based on what is going to help you uh, connect with your audience the most. So this is the kind of self-deceit that is the passion of the type three. So what, what would you add to that? Yeah, I really like that uh, you explained self-deceit as being the shape-shifting tendency itself. I, I think this is essential to understand. And therefore, to understand that the shape-shifting that threes do is uh, perhaps the most important uh, thing to observe in personality. Now, that uh, self-deceit also happens in very indirect ways, like when threes take in other people's feelings or objectives in life, they, they are in self-deceit when they are converting themselves into that other person. They are not that person. And they live a life of just uh, being different depending on where they are and who they are talking to. Um, so that also shows up when threes adapt their language to talk to different people, different groups of friends, or they dress differently depending on where they go, or the kind of goals and challenges they undertake and how they go for them, you know, how they behave, the things they say they value. So everything gets determined by that self-deceit. Self-deceit is simply not being in touch with who I am, having become the prototype of what each person wants me to be. While veracity, which is the virtue for threes, is being nothing but who I am, being nothing else, and regardless of what people will think of me. If you are a three, you need to know you are emotional and in touch with veracity, you will stop lying to yourself and the world as if you were not emotional. So veracity has to be to, to do with being who you are, and that includes being emotional. Um, there is a willingness in the inside of never lying, never being fake. So in personality, it's a pity that that's not what we see. But when threes are in touch, with the virtue of veracity, there is nothing in their hearts that wishes to be fake. 
And it's amazing and inspiring to see that. Okay, beautiful. Let's move on to type four. For type four, the passion is envy. And envy in fours manifests as a painful sense of lack and a craving toward that which is seen as lacking or felt as lacking. For fours, envy grows out of a sense of loss that leads to a perception that something good is outside the fours experience. Something good is outside of themselves and that this something is necessary but missing because of some sort of inner deficiency on their part. So it's a it's the habit of comparing themselves to others and the feeling that derives from that ongoing comparison that either puts them below or sometimes above, uh, but often at a deeper level, it, it gives them this inner sense of inferiority that comes from looking out into the world and discerning that they have less or are less or are missing something good that other people have. I think that many fours avoid uh, saying that some of the main traits of this, the four personality come from envy because envy is sort of seen as a less beautiful word, but it's very useful for uh, the inner, inner work of force to name many things as envy. And let me say a few more. So both feeling inferior or superior is envy you can't feel inferior or superior unless you're comparing yourself uh, to someone else and comparison is envy and when you compare and you complain about the person or when you disdain someone or you become harsh with the person that's envy because you are seeing how you are uh, superior now if you admire that person a lot that's also envy potentially because you're looking at the person as if the person was above you right idealizing the person and in, in, uh, in the inside you may be developing that energy in your heart of wanting to be that person now the virtue for force is brilliant it's called equanimity um Equanimity on in here has to do with balance, but it's balance in different ways. It's first of all balance of how I see myself and others. Um, it's it's an, a new way to to feel who I am in front of others that make me feel we are equals. So this is equanimity. Another way equanimity is balance is that force become really uh, non-emotional, more neutral in the heart. And they stop comparing and everything is simpler. And they actually, at this point, want to go for what's simple, not for what, for what is different or sophisticated. Even their movements are economical or the way they dress, the way they speak, um, they, they, they become more harmonious with everything. Um, and that has to do with equanimity. It's also calmness of the heart. And this person is not affected by external stimuli. Um, and they respond to these things exactly as much as necessary. Um, so it's a totally different thing you see from a four when, uh, when they get in touch with, uh, this higher side of being called equanimity. That's very clear. Let's do a short break. Hello, it's me, Uranio. Just to tell you that BNI launched a new online workshop called the Enneagram Masterclass. It's a six hour video course that you can access at cpenneagram.com. You can go at your own pace and have lifetime access to it. Many beginner students have already watched it, but advanced students can also learn about the nine types in a deeper way. We can't wait for you to check it out. Get $75 off your purchase by using code CHESNUTPIES75 on 
cpenagram.com. Lee and Yiranyu offer much, much more high-quality Enneagram content on www.cpenneagram.com. If you are an Enneagram enthusiast, visit the website now, www.cpenneagram.com. So I'll move on to type five. The passion here is avarice. So I'll define it, and then maybe you can expand on it from your own internal experience of avarice. Avarice is a holding back and holding in. It's the hoarding of time and space and resources out of a fear of impending impoverishment. It's not so much greediness as it is a retentiveness, a drive to hold on to what they already have and be economical with what they have rather than a drive to acquire more. So it's a kind of withholding out of a fear of depletion. Can you expand on that for us? Sure. I think um, I think a simpler way to understand avarice is just by understanding that in avarice, the heart shuts down, both for receiving and for giving. Um, it's like staying with oneself. It's like a, a heart that closes the doors and the windows, you know, and uh, avarice this way becomes lack of intensity, um, a, a movement against any abundance and against any feeling, because feelings tend to be um, something that open the heart back, right? And avarice has an agenda of shutting the heart down. So uh, emotions are not welcome from the avarice's perspective. Um, and, and then there, there is this compulsion towards hoarding knowledge and knowing things just as a means to not be in touch with the poverty felt in the heart um, and an incapacity to feel what others are feeling, to give or receive whatever, care, love, any other thing. Uh, even having a neutral language and not expressing emotions is uh, avarice in itself. It's, uh, uh, you know, an indirect manifestation. Everything that tends to be neutral or, or controlled exists because the heart is not completely open. Mm -hmm. And it's scary. Uh, when I, while I open my heart, the more I open my heart, the, the less I see my old self-control, uh, self-control inability. And it's scary, but it seems it's the path forward. Now, the virtue for fives is called non-attachment. And we, we use this word instead of detachment because detachment can be a bit confusing. So non-attachment is when the heart is not attached to what is already inside it, no previous content. So it opens the doors to let all that go and opens the doors to allow everything new to come in. It becomes open both for inputs and outputs. And then this non-attachment doesn't choose what is going to come inside and what is going to go outside. There is no self-control. So in non-attachment, fives become uh, in sync with all life flow, all life force. It feels like all the energy of nature is coming inside the heart and flowing outside it because there is no need to hoard. Uh, and we, fives this way become very intense and very connected. It feels like an interconnectedness with all there is, things and people. So moving on to type six, and most of us probably understand what fear is. Uh, I was surprised to learn when I was first studying the Enneagram that many sixes reported that when before they learned the Enneagram, they didn't label what they experienced as fear. So even though many of us who aren't sixes might think, oh, well, how could fear be very unconscious? Well, in sixes, they often describe it as, like all the rest of the passions, something that can be quite unconscious. 
Um, so fear is an unpleasant emotional and physiological response to recognize sources of danger. And here's this is important. It usually goes hand in hand with anxiety, which can be more or less conscious depending on subtype. Uh, but the anxiety includes apprehension, tension, or uneasiness related to the anticipation of danger, the source of which is unknown or unrecognized or may originate even inside one's own mind. Anything you would add to that? Yeah, I think that fear needs to be seen in very simple things. Like whenever a six goes to a public place and there are people around and they start unconsciously trying to listen what they are talking about or to see what they are doing. It, it's all coming from fear. Uh, like paying attention to whatever is happening in the ray of two or three meters or nine or 10 feet from me, you know? So um, apart from this, uh, you know, accelerating uh, your thoughts or uh, your conclusions uh, because of anxiety can come out of fear or avoiding decisions or making decisions too early. Whatever is coming from anxiety is fear. I really like to see anxiety this way as being like fear's uh, brother or sister. You know, it's like they are almost the same. And, um, you know, also the communicate the communication pattern of saying it depends what if it, it comes from fear it's like i i procrastinate i i don't move myself owning my own authority right now the virtue of sixes is the opposite of fear and it's called courage so courage needs to be understood as uh, not exactly the absence of fear, but the capacity of going ahead despite fear. It's like, uh, you know, owning your fear and doing the next move, going ahead and having your next step. That next step is courage itself. And doing inner work it is a courageous act, like looking at your fear, seeing that you are projecting, for instance, and saying, here I am, I'll take full responsibility of this, and I'll go ahead, and I'll do it differently, and then I go. It's like, I I don't delegate my power to anyone else. I'm, I don't seek for a strong authority, or I don't get stuck with an authority I don't believe in. I, I own my own authority. I cease to be um, avoiding of my power. And I become the leader, the leader of my own life. And I revolutionize it if needed. So the virtue of courage has to do also with going ahead and, and doing things with your heart open, not shutting down your heart. Okay, so moving on to type seven, the passion of type seven is gluttony. Now, we commonly think of gluttony as uh, connected to food and drink and indulging too much. Uh, but in the Enneagram understanding, it's an excessive indulgence in consuming whatever brings pleasure. But, and we're often asked, what's the difference between gluttony and lust? Well, it's it's not so much an immersion in a pleasurable experience like lust is. Gluttony rather is a desire to taste a little bit of everything, to sample as many, uh, uh, as many of a variety of things uh, without being limited as opposed to deeply experiencing them. Uh, so it's, it's like uh, it's sort of more consuming a little bit of everything rather than fully digesting or fully uh, taking in more and more and more to a deep level. Uh, and inevitably, of course, this leads to dissatisfaction and a sense of insufficiency. Uh, but then that gets masked by the pursuit of more, uh, more experience, more pleasurable experience, more trying a little bit of everything. So it's more of a variety rather than a, a depth. Would you add anything to clarify that? I 
think we can see gluttony when, uh, if you are seven, you can see it when you're trying not to miss out on any possibilities, when you develop different interests at a time, uh, when you multitask, when you jump from one activity to another, when the first one becomes a little less interesting or the other one becomes more interesting, uh, sometimes not finishing up ideas and projects. Uh, also, leaving conclusions open, for instance, is a sign of gluttony because you don't want to miss out uh, um, on any opportunity, right? Or feeling amazed, thrilled, energized, excited. I know it feels good, but it's coming from gluttony. Now, when sevens do the work and get in touch with the virtue of sobriety, they don't feel that. What they feel is the opposite. They want less. They want, they, they become automatically more serious. Now, watch out because from the seven's personality or from gluttony, this sounds horrible. But when sevens are really in touch with sobriety, this virtue, they love it. And it feels to them that they are truly being joyful for the first time in their lives. It's not only about being happy, but it's more about being joyful. And it's not about desires and pleasures. It's about fulfilling your heart. Now, in sobriety, sevens do one thing at a time. They don't want to do two things. They go to the end. Therefore, they have a beautiful focus that help them out in their lives or careers. And they are rooted in the moment, grounded, and they are present. And they absorb nothing, nothing more or nothing less than what they need. And they don't waste energy. They don't disperse their energy in things out there. They are in touch with themselves, in touch with what's happening here and now, and they are sober. And they are not doing anything to get distracted from that moment. It's brilliant, very inspiring to see a seven like that. Yes, it's when they can focus. It's when they can sink more deeply into the present moment and really experience, which I think, like you're saying, can be a big relief once they get it. Uh, because gluttony is just a, it can be directed to different things, uh, but when they're in sobriety, it's, it's a real almost coming home to a deeper part of themselves. It's time for our top five today. What is our top five today, B? The top five today is the five types most likely to do inner work. And we were thinking the top five most likely to be attracted to doing any wor inner work, uh, and to be mo most diligent about it, starting with number five. And I have to say, when I one one factor I was thinking about when I was figuring out what my five were was the types that we tend to see coming to our inner work retreats a lot, and the types we don't. I have to say, that was one factor, not the whole t thing. But uh, there are certain types we get a lot of, and and our inner work retreats are very deep. It's it's not for everyone. It's it's for people who are really ready to face themselves and really leverage the enneagram in the way it was meant to be leveraged as a deep inner work tool. So um, so anyway, my number five is twos. Now I was a little bit torn on twos because on the one hand. I, th I think we get a lot of twos, not every time, but we do get a lot of twos and we see a lot of twos engaging in inner work. We see a lot of twos engaging in inner work. And certainly when I was a psychotherapist, I had a lot of two clients. So I think one reason why twos come to the inner work is when they experience problems in relationships it's very difficult because relationships tend to be at the center of their lives and the center of their experience. So I think we do get a lot of twos and twos generally really are motivated to work on themselves. Uh, but I also think that some twos don't come to inner work. They don't really do the self-development uh, effort because of the pride. I think pride can sometimes make the two 
believe there's no problem here. So, yes. So, B, I th you know, I first want to say that I actually don't see a big difference between all the nine types when it comes to uh, which one does more inner work. Uh, you know, after uh, 20 plus years, I, I don't think that there is so much difference than I used to think. Um, but it's true that sometimes come more to specific retreats, others go to other kinds of um, inner work opportunities. You know, I think it's tricky. I think that what differentiates the most, uh, what uh, makes people come to do inner work, it's not actually type, it's life circumstances and, uh, you know, callings people have, and that happens to everybody. However, I think there are differences. So my fifth is one, type one. I've had many one students in the past in sort of in-depth workshops. And I think that many times ones come to workshops because in the beginning they think it's an opportunity for improvement and that attracts them. So self-development, yeah, I need to self-develop, but they don't really know that uh, what, what we tell them when they arrive, right? Which is, if you're a one, you need to become worse, right? So you, you, uh, you need anyway, to stop all the self-development. You, you exactly, need to stop all the yeah, self-development. You're yeah. doing it too much already every day. <laughs> Yeah, and um, it, it's more about allowing yourself to live life more freely, you know? Now, yeah, so this is my fifth. What is your fourth, B? My fourth is fives. And this is because I see a similar thing to twos, that there's some, some things that bring fives to the work. Uh, you often see them in certain settings, uh, but some things that don't. Uh, sometimes when I've done Enneagram panels where I have fives talking about their inner work and their experience, I notice that sometimes fives have the sense that everything's kind of okay. You know, they've created certain boundaries in their lives. They have certain routines and ways that they, you know, control what's happening. And so there's no real problem. Uh, sometimes they aren't in touch with the deeper sense of the pain of disconnection. Let's put it that way. On the other hand, I think a lot of fives, uh, especially when they learn the Enneagram, get very interested in the Enneagram system itself and also the inner work that it points to. Uh, and so I think also there are fives that do get in touch with the pain of not engaging fully with life. And I think those fives get very motivated, um, but we don't see as many fives in our workshops. And certainly uh, maybe that's, uh, it's also an intimidating factor around doing inner work with, in a group of people. So there could be that element of that as well. Mm. So that, that's my number okay. four. Yeah, I ended up not having fives uh, between my, among my top five here today, but uh, my fourth is choose. Um, so I basically agree with all you said. I think that sometimes twos come to uh, inner work thinking that they can better understand the partner or the friend or the, you know, the son or the daughter. And they end up then seeing things inside themselves. But I do see that many twos come to this work. So what is your third B? My third is nines, and I think nines do come to the inner work quite a lot. I see them getting interested, even in organizations. When I've worked in organizations, they express a lot of interest in, in the Enneagram and knowing themselves at a deeper level. I think sometimes what happens with nines is they, they, they wake up at one point a bit and recognize that they're not fully connected to themselves and that doesn't feel right. It can look like uh, not being in a relationship that's not working, that they can't really find their way out of. It can look like being stuck in a career that they really didn't choose. Uh, it can feel like not being fully alive. And so I do find we get a lot of nines that come to uh, our retreats and that are very interested in, in accessing their own power more, 
uh, acting on their own behalf, getting in touch with their own agenda. Uh, so nines are my number three. My number three is sixes. I always see many sixes doing this work. I think that they sometimes come first because they think there is something wrong with them. Um, and they are curious also. Um, and I simply see a lot of sixes. I'm not sure I understand totally the reasons why some types might be more attracted to inner work, but I, I just see that sixes stick with this somehow. And my hypothesis is that sixes are inherently stronger to do the difficult parts of inner work. Now, what is your second? Thing? Well, my second is sixes. And I agree with what you said. I, I definitely think that in some ways sixes experience some of the pain of being in personality more than other types might, where their personality kind of solves the problems as opposed to creating problems. Whereas for sixes, I think, you know, being fearful can be di a difficult experience. And to the extent that they're in touch with their fear or the activity, the overactivity, the over responsibility that drives, that fear drives in them, uh, they can be a bit more in touch with the need to make a change. I also think an important thing uh, about sixes is they, they tend to be, a, they tend to be humble. Uh, they tend to be more self-deprecating. I think some of the types that can be a little bit more in pride or a little bit more of an elevated mood or sense of themselves sometimes don't come as much to the inner work because they can create a kind of positive feeling uh, or a kind of a, a little bit of a unconscious grandiosity. Whereas sixes, I think, tend to side with the underdog. They tend to uh, not see themselves as... Uh, as so their, their self image isn't so puffed up that uh, doing self development work doesn't poke that too much. In, in other words, they're already humble. Uh, they don't they don't necessarily resist being humbled by uh, the experience of, of doing the, the hard work of self development. Interesting. Yeah, my second is nine. Um, so we inverted right your third is my second my second is your third so nines uh, in my view not only all you said which i agree with but i think that nines have this mechanism of yeah i'm in and i'll join i'll be with all of you guys and they they just um you know want to be part of and and they give it a try uh, to many other things, not only inner work. But uh, then I also think there is this uh, instinctive piece that it's like, it's like a calling. It's like, hmm, I think this is something I need to do. And they go ahead and register at a retreat, you know? Um, and what I'm curious, I think our number one will be the same, but which one is Yes, yours? I think so too. And one more thing I want to say about nines is similar to sixes, they tend to be more humble when they're in personality and that could be another thing. Um, so fours is my number one. And uh, I think fours really engage in self-development work a lot. Uh, certainly when I was a psychotherapist, I had a lot of four clients and I always experienced them as fully engaged in their process of development. I think that fours are motivated to come because oftentimes they are in touch with the pain of being in personality and all the limitations uh, that that brings. They're, they don't hide from the pain of just being in a personality as much as other types might. Uh, also, they similar to twos, if they are experiencing difficulty in connecting with others or in relationships, often that can stimulate them to want to uh, do inner work. Uh, and I also just think they tend to be very aware of and engaged in their internal processes. Uh, they tend to be people who are very just deeply interested in understanding people generally, but especially what's going on inside them. Uh, very engaged with their own emotional territory, with their own ups and downs, and wanting to have some sort of relief from what can sometimes be 
uh, an extremely painful experience of inner deficiency. Uh, so for all of these many reasons, I, I see fours as, as being very likely in, in, to come to inner work and doing uh, diligent work when they do. So yeah, fours is also my first, uh, my number one. And to add to all that you've already explained, uh, I want to say that to me, point four is the point of the seeker on the Enneagram. That's what I feel, what I sense. And, and this is because, um, you know, the energy of force is the energy of never, ever being um, okay with what we are already living. There is something else to go try to find. Uh, we need to move on, we, and there is existential questioning, and we are not happy with uh, the current state of things. And the four in each of us is willing, therefore, to um, to investigate um, and, and to do existential work, right? Um, and last thing about this, I believe the fours are attracted to depth and to anything that's deep. And inner work is definitely deep and sometimes difficult. So this is why I have force in my number one list. Okay, so that's our top five for this week. And we thank you for listening. And please join us again for our Enneagram 2.0 podcast, where we talk about all things Enneagram. Please click on like to help spread the word about our podcast.